Hello and welcome to this video and here I am with my lovely patrons and today we're going to be talking about our most memorable concerts that we've been to. Um, it might be incredible bands that are no longer with us or just stuff that happened on that. My patrons are highly knowledgeable and very experienced musicians and music fans so I have no idea they're going to mention. So what I'm going to do I think um, looking at the screen as I am I'm going to start off with Colin and I'm going to go around Colin in, in a clockwise, like, clockwise direction. So, Colin, what, what have you got first to tell us about? Right. You see this shirt I've got on here? Pink Floyd. Yeah. Don't let that be a giveaway because it's nothing to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very, very good prog genius. And I think you've mentioned it before. It's Kate Bush. Kate Bush. Kate Bush. 1979. Apollo Manchester and uh, I remember it uh, I took my girlfriend actually you, you didn't sort of take your girlfriends to concerts did you really back then you took your mates didn't you but this one with it being Kate Bush I thought yeah we'll take the girlfriend and uh, when I bought the first album I'd got uh, the Bush Club so we got priority on tickets so we got the front row so we're in the front row all waiting for the concert and it started, and it was, it was a theatrical start, as you would expect with Kate. And she come on, and I thought, hang on a minute, she's miming. I thought, this is, you know, knowing a bit about music back then, even. I thought, she's miming, she's got no microphone, she's dancing and stuff. But it turns out it was a, a technological start. The stage, um, the guy who was doing the stage <laughs> now, had invented the wireless mic with a wire coat hanger. And some technology that she was the first person to ever have a boom pipe, which was a bit of wire off an old uh, cotton. So, yeah, we didn't know that at the time. We just thought, she's miming, she's miming. Anyway, so, yeah, it was all um, fantastic music and the dancing and stuff. Oh, just a couple of shout outs. The, the band were great. And there was a guy called Kevin McClellan. I think he was in Battle of James Harvest and uh, he went to <coughs> that. Nina, number one in 84, was that 99 Red Balloons? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a, yeah, it was, say again. I said, yes, yes, Nina, 99 Red Balloons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then there was uh, Alan Murphy. I think he went on with Go West and uh, Level 42. Anyway, so the band and the dancers were fantastic. So it was Alan Murphy on guitar on that tour? Yeah. Because he, he was an incredible guitar player. It was fantastic. Uh, there's a, a concert died, of Go he? West. They were on the tube, and you check out his guitaring. It's very Alan Holdsworth yeah. influence. That Kate right. Bush tour was the tour that I mean, it did her in, didn't it? She tried to do so much on it that yeah. sort of she never really did anything again, did she? You know, so uh, yeah. so that you were very lucky to see her on that. It was um, an incredible I show. Um, carry um, on, Colin. But, but, yeah, but the the thing that it made the most for me as a twenty year old about. Three quarters of the way through the concert, she come and sat right on the front of the stage, which is where I work. And I'm thinking, this is going to be all right. She's literally like three foot away from me. And she started singing Feel It, which is about a, a woman who's sort of thinking about an encounter with a bloke that she's never met, uh, never explored. So it was quite a, you know, a sexy song for a 20 year old sat there, but girlfriends are here, aren't she? And uh, all of a sudden, this cameraman, Granada Cameras, for them that's not in the UK, Granada's just a, a northern uh, camera company. And they were filming it, and they come right in front of me. So I'm like, what's happening here? So as she starts the song, I'm sort of going, looking like this. And she realised it, and she put it into the song. She followed me. As I went up, she was doing that. And I went above the camera, and she did the same all the way through the song. And it was unbelievable. Girlfriend Lady says she was physically undressing you during that song. I said, yeah, no, it was great. It was absolutely fantastic. And, yes, it was just that feeling of being – I was part of the show. She was she was feeding on the audience and the fact that the camera had blocked me from her <clears throat> or her from me, and it was just like this, and it was perfect for the song. I didn't expect this meeting to get so erotic so quickly. <laughs> I, yeah, I knew it was on the cards, but not that quick. I mean, we've been going for five minutes. That's in, that's an incredible song. Okay, Kate Bush. Let's see if anyone's going to beat Kate Bush. So, Neil, what have you got? Oh, nothing compares with that. 
<laughs> the best it's hard it's hard to pick the best for for what by what criterion i think you know, when, when someone says you know what gigs have you seen it's the it's the one that always comes into your head first i suppose i guess i i have like three categories of great like um uh one that just really left an impression on me was seeing xtc in 1977 or eight at rafters in manchester i'd only heard of them in uh like the previous summer holidays from a friend, uh, somebody said, "Oh yeah, this is band called XTC," and they came up by that, and they were that was just exciting stuff, and I didn't really know their stuff at all at the time. I think I'd bought white, it was the white music time of white music, and I just bought that just before, and uh, that was incredibly exciting just to see something really different at the at the time. Uh, the XTC but, are a band that I have missed out on, and I've I've got I've got um, English Settlement. I've got that album. I really like it, but they've just always seemed to pass me by. And I imagine I would really like them, but when I delve in, I never quite find exactly what I want, what I expect, you know. But they're so they're one of those bands that eluded eluded me, sorry, for many years. But to see them in '77, I suppose that would have been in <laughs> right at the start, wouldn't it? They, That's right at the start. That was White, yeah. White Music was their first album. Funny thing is, people always talk about English Settlement. I followed them for their f- first three albums, which was um, White Music Go and Drums and Wires. I really like that period. And what would you suggest I go and listen to? Oh, Drums and Wires is a very good album. Yeah. Guy Larking. That's later, you see. That's yes. that's I, I was I was in and out of XTC by then. I was off doing something else. And well, they much. say they've made so many albums since, and I don't know anything yeah. about those. And some of the fans seem to really rate these albums. I mean, they're incredible talents. And uh, um what's uh, Andy Partridge is um huge Tony Williams lifetime fan. Right. Yeah. And uh, there's an interview right. with him on there. Uh, I can't remember who it's with. It might be with Greg Bendian. And he picks up his guitar and he starts playing the, the John McLaughlin licks of, of Lifetime. Incredible. Yeah, he's, he really yeah. knows what he's doing. So I'm going to move on to Ray Paul. Hello, Ray. Hey, how are you guys doing? I'm, I'm good. Good. Wow. Look at all these paintings. <laughs> always get the paintings. Yeah, these are all done under the influence of... Jazz fusion in your channel, these back here. So, oh, what are you going to say then? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Give you some artistic, uh, artistic inspiration here. I thought, I thought you were going to say they'd be painted on the influence of uh, drugs. I mean, we'd had sex, so then we go drugs straight away. I thought, well, God, we get, <laughs> we have any, so Ray, what have you got for us? We've had XTC and Kate Bush. Um, I got to go back, um, back to my probably one of my first concerts. When I was 16, when I can I go with my friends and and uh, we we're uh, it was 1979. It was Cheap Trick, but I was told you know the opening band you know you got to watch out for this opening band uh, this guitarist like my guitar teacher was telling me about and these seemed like these random people coming up you got to watch out for the opening bands guitarist turned out to be um, uh, the Ian Hunter band and they're uh, never alone with this schizophrenic album and it was uh, Mick Ronson. On guitar and it was like i was like just a kid like i was thought i was some hot shot you know young guitarist 16 years old and then on stage was like mick you know they opened up for cheap trick and cheap trick came on and they were gushing about you know mick ronson just the sight of him with his long hair with the low slung you know les paul just giving a master class on you know, rock guitar and it and uh cheap trick on their um encore that put them that Brought him on stage to play with him. And I just remember the bass player like mouthing the, the chords of the cheap six trons when the crowds was there playing. So that was definitely, definitely. And so that on that tour, I mean, he, in 79, Mick Rockson would have sort of had a legendary, he's, he would have been bigger than anybody in Cheap Trick. Is that right? Uh, I would, uh, we were like just the, like the, uh, people a little older than me and like more in the know kind of. Uh, I mean, we heard, you know, he was played with the Ziggy Stardust and uh, Mata Hoople. We were all aware, aware of that. And, uh, it was like a one-off two show that I think that was the only show that that uh, Ian Hunter opened up for was, was with Cheap Trick because I kind of looked it up and I was, um, but yeah, we were kind of aware, you know, of Nick Ronson. But I mean, after that, it was like, okay, that's 
you know, that's a rock guitar guy right there. I mean, we were pretty close, like right in the middle. And, and you also awesome. saw, you saw Cheap Trick at their peak in 79. Yeah, I mean, I, we were big in 78, trick. isn't it? Yeah, yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're all like Big Who fans and Cheap Trick fans and that uh, Buzz Cox album, Singles Going Steady, was a big influence like early on. And so, yeah, I was like, so I was really into that the power kind of power pop and to see that yeah. was, yeah. Nick Ronson, I mean, it was it was it was special it's always it's always stuck in my mind just as but in the center stage you know that low that was Paul was like that's a rock god man it's sure. often when when you get to a gig where the band's too big for the venue as well do you know when you get to see something up close it always makes a difference. I've seen some incredible artists but from a long, long, long way away. And I can't sometimes I can't even remember it, you know. But I think if you yeah. if you're in a smaller venue and it's up close, it's a completely different experience, isn't it? Yeah, close enough to see them, you know, the big mouthing B A chords and Nick yeah. Robinson while he was while I was playing. I was like, How lucky was that? You know, yeah. not too long after I saw John Cougar open up for the Kinks in a, even a smaller venue in that year when he was still John Cougar. That was that was pretty special too. Like they were just one after the other, kind of thing. I used to so, be quite good friends with Kenny Aranoff, who was John Cougar's drummer. Oh I yeah, did a clinic tour with him. Kenny's a lovely bloke and an incredible. He's so rock and roll, you know, and he's got the cut off t shirts and the big muscles and the bald head and the dark sunglasses, and he 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 is just the out and out rock guy, and he's played with absolutely everybody. And uh, I did um, um, a drum clinic with him. And um, when we got to the clinic, the guy said, could you play Blaze of Glory? Because he, he drummed on Blaze of Glory for John Bon Jovi. So he said, yeah, sure. And so he phones up. Um, or, yeah, it, it, was, it was the internet was there, but it wasn't like it is now. It's 2005. And they faxed through a chart of uh, the Blaze of Glory drum track. And he said, have you got it on CD? And they found a CD of it. And Kenny sat down and he sight read through Blaze of Glory in such a way that you couldn't hear the drums on the original CD. He was exactly on yeah. top. And I remember thinking, my God, this is a monster, you know. And you see all the rock and roll thing, but the amount of control that guy had. And I can remember chatting to him and he actually started off in a symphony orchestra as a percussionist, you know. So, uh, yeah, incredible. And uh, that drum break on Jack and Diane, you know, the uh, Kenny's drum break on that. It's one of the great drum breaks of all time, isn't it? I think uh, Nick, Nick Ronson produced that. Or he, he was on that track. I, I really? That oh, I'm glad you've yeah. tied it back. He, he, I, he, he, um, I think Mellicamp might have produced that final album Nick Ronson did right before he died, the Hall, Hall whatever that was. Um, so they were, they kind of worked together somehow. Huh. Yeah. I, I remember seeing Jack and Diane Mellencamp had some uh Ronson had something to do with that. With yeah, was, I don't know how that drum me such so weird. It was a number one record in the States. And I don't know. There's very few number ones that have like almost like a drum solo halfway through. It's very strange. Yeah, yeah that that was a good that was a cool song. He yeah. was really good. That's when he was like real just starting out, the small field house at the University of Cincinnati it was like, you know, eight thousand seat arena, but we were right up there. It was it was cool. Here in the UK, more... if you mentioned John Cougar yeah. Mellencamp to most people, they wouldn't know who he was. Really? Hey, Colin. Yeah. No. No. Yeah, I remember. Never. Yeah, it's like one of those bands that the all artists that has transferred over to here. You know, maybe like two, like Slade in the states. You know, <laughs> Slade, like <laughs> the biggest band, one of the biggest bands. Every Christmas they roll out their Christmas single. And every everybody knows Slade, and then when I chat to Americans, they have never heard of Slade. So it's it's one of those. Yeah. I'm gonna move on to David then. Um, David, oh, what, what have you got? Well, um, it was a close. Oh, look at that been Slade been... alive! What a band! Eight track as well. <laughs> Eight track <laughs> Slade. Oh my god! <laughs> I think we're going to have to do a video on your eight track collection and the seventy eight at some point, Colin. <laughs> So, so, yeah, David, carry on. So it was a close tie, I'm afraid, between you two... You can do both. We've got plenty of time. Between two different Hawkwind concerts. Oh, One Hawkwind. was in 1984, and it was the last concert that Robert Calvert ever played with Hawkwind. It was here in my hometown of Ramsgate, at the Ramsgate Marina. And it absolutely rocked, but it also absolutely rained as well. 
Was, but, was it, um, is, it, is Ramsgate were, Arena outside? Well, Ramsgate Marina was kind of basically like one of these weird swimming pools where you let the sea in and they drained it and they were thinking of turning it into a gig venue. And they had this sort of battle of the bands there with local bands and Hawkwind's Nick Turner, because Nick Turner was back in Hawkwind, was um, comparing it. Um, but the whole event was so loud that the council got complaints, so they never actually turned it into a venue. And it's mm -hmm. now been turned into flats. But it was a notable gig because it was uh, Robert Calvert rejoined Hawkwind. It's the first time he played with them since 78. And it was his last ever gig with them because he died four years later. But um, And they were supposed to be doing some work with him, but it's Hawkwind, so they sometimes don't get it together, you know. Um, but it was a fantastic gig. Um, but it was pipped for me by a gig in 2001, which was at Canterbury Ephraim Gardens which was this small outside festival, which had some fantastic bands. Not only did it have Hawkwind, it had Porcupine Tree, Caravan, Osabisa, and a local band called The Hamsters, um, who were kind of a blues rock band, who were very good. But are The Hamsters local to there, are they? I think they were Kent local, but I think that was their last gig, and we didn't turn up in time, unfortunately, to see them, um, which is a shame, because I'd heard they were really, really good. I, I saw the hamsters. They, they were they 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 were just sort of this sort of Hendrixy blues yeah. power trio, uh, mm. and and back in the early two thousands, I I played with um, Ian Park, who was a blues guitarist, and I also played a little bit for Ainsley Lister and a little bit for Joe Anshaw Taylor, and I did the whole blues thing. And the hamsters were really were sort of idolised by that. They they created without labels or anything a, a huge following. And we'd get to do gigs like well, that. We were, a bit dis we were a bit disappointed we didn't get to see them, but getting there through traffic and stuff, it's just one of those things. Sometimes you miss stuff. Um, then also Beasts played, and I didn't really know much about them, but I recognised their hit without even knowing what it was because obviously it had been played so much in the 70s on the radio that you just kind of recognised it. And then Caravan, who were fantastic. Um, Porcupine Tree, who were doing their light bulb sun stuff, but they played some of their older tunes as well. Um, from Stupid Dream, and they played Radioactive Toy and stuff like that. Um, and then Hawkwind came on. Um, and what was great about this particular Hawkwind lineup was it had both Simon House and Hugh Lord Langton in it. So you had possibly the two best instrumentalists who'd ever been in Hawkwind in the same lineup. And it's just a shame that they ever did an album and made use of these two guys together because it was an absolute stonking gig. It rocked. And then um, to top it off, just they kind of had a little break and um, Arthur Brown, who's comparing, came on and did fire to a backing track. Um, <laughs> and he had his flaming helmet on and he took it off and it looked as though he burned all his hair off because he had this big bald patch on. And then he came back on and he sang Silver Machine with Hawkwind. And then he kind of started a kind of, uh, he kind of semi-joined Hawkwind for two or three years and was kind of a sort of front man doing all the Robert Calvert stuff for like 2002, 2003. Um, so this is Mount Ephraim Gardens. They still have, I think, the festival there. I think there was one this year, um, which had like System 7 and um, Gong and Osric Tentacles there, stuff like that. So, you know, that was a great gig in 2001. That's possibly my favourite gig. But I've been to, I've been lucky to be to a lot of great gigs from a lot of great bands, even this year. So you were fun to the sort of more trippy end of prog. No, I, I, I quite like, I like space rock, but I like heavy prog. I like King Crimson, Van de Graaff, Generator, um, Goblin, who I saw. That was a great gig. That could have been in my top five as well in Brighton. Um, Claudio Simonetti's Goblin. That was really good. Um, played all the Dario Argento soundtrack stuff. Um, so I kind of like the heavier end of prog. But, you know, I, so, I mean, in terms of space rock, stuff like Far Flung and First Band from Outer Space, Cows are sweet, um, who are kind of almost they've got a bit of space rock, but they're stoner rock as well. Um, but there's a great album by them called Live in Copenhagen, which has got a fantastic track with an amazing saxophone solo on it as well. It's definitely worth checking out. But I like all the stuff that you've been showing. You know, um, I checked out Fai Yang Zek because of what you said, a Tony Williams Lifetime. Um, so I like some fusion stuff as well and some classic rock, but ambient music, all, all sorts of different stuff. <laughs> well, I, but, I, I, I've never got on with Hawkwind. It's like, um, then, and it's what I, when I was a kid, I got, um, it was like a compilation album called Masters of the Universe. Yeah. And it was okay. I didn't hate it. And, and then I, I bought a picture disc of Silver Machine, mm. which was a beautiful picture disc. And then this 
kid at school said he'd got his album that was unlistable. He hated it. And I said, well, I'll swap the picture disc, my silver machine picture <laughs> disc for that album. And that's yeah. where it all started because that was the Yes album. And I took that home and I went, whoa, this is it's, this is what I want. You know, <laughs> loads I of complexity of fiddling around. Hawkwind were two, two just going on and on and on on one chord. They can be. I think they're best seen live. They can be, um, they're a bit, they're not, obviously, they're not like a lot of, I mean, I, I think they kind of, like my criteria for prog is if it appears in prog rock magazine, I kind of count it sort of thing, basically. Oh, which that, is, I know that's a very got... good definition. We have never had that one before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've got quite a wide definition. I think it's quite good because I think it provides, it kind of creates a sort of a scene and that kind of gives the bands a bit of extra momentum, I think. Um, you know, and there's all sorts of stuff in there, you know, that you would think, is that really prog? But well, you know, it's in there. I can kind of see why they put it in there. You know, like Kate Bush and XTC, you know, they re reviewed XTC albums in there. They reviewed Kate Bush. Um, you know, they reviewed all sorts of stuff. So, but I can see some people don't like Hawkwind. They're a bit kind of, they're really a stoner rock band with sort of a few prog and sci-fi elements, I would say. Yeah. You know, I don't but, hate them. I, I, I like it yeah. for five minutes, but then they but that, that compilation, they I a think, bit longer than five minutes, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> I think that compilation is a little bit um, dreary, actually. I think Space Ritual, Warrior on the Edge of Time are the best place for the early Hawkwind to start. Yeah, yeah. And you can get the Can To Be Fair album on CD, although it's quite hard to track down. They Sadly, they don't credit Hugh Lang tonight, but he was there because I was right down the front. I know he's there. His guitar playing's all over it. But that's that's worth getting if you can get it because it's pretty in-your-face sort of thing. It's very psychedelic. <laughs> but great fun. I'm going to move on to Steve now. So what have you got for us, Steve? Uh, well, going back about 50 years now, uh, I was 16. Um, in the days before the internet and postal tickets, you had to queue up for your tickets. And uh, me and six friends queued up outside the Hippodrome in Birmingham all night to get tickets for yes. Yeah. And, and, it was, and it was an unusual event, should we say, because... The evening mail came down and took a photograph of us because they couldn't understand why we were stood there the night before to get tickets. Um, and we, we we got the tickets. We got front row tickets, as you could in them days. And uh, we went to the gig. And, uh, yes, came on, and they, they played Siberian Car too. This is like the, the topogra topographic uh, tour. So... Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, they went through Siberian Carter and then John Anderson introduced the band and everything and said a few words. And he goes, I'd like you to pay attention to this lot on the front row. He said, they queued up all night. And he'd actually got a picture from the <laughs> from the uh, from the evening mail from a few, you know, a few months ago. And he was showing it, you know, he held it up and he goes, This lot queued up all night to see us, you know. So he said they deserve a round of applause. So we all had a round of applause. Um, and then at the end of the gig, when they were going off, Rick Whiteman, because he he was um, he was well known for a glass of brown ale and peanuts. <laughs> so as he came off, he was throwing peanuts at us, which was you know, <laughs> I think my mate got one. I think he kept it for years. <laughs> he got Rick Whiteman's peanuts. So you know that was that was that was one. I mean, I've been to that many. I mean, I saw Genesis as a support band for Van de Graaff Generator, and they were like, absolutely brilliant, you know, and it was one of those where the support band, everyone's in the bar. This is at the town hall in Birmingham. Everyone goes to the bar when the support band's on. But I didn't. I stayed there and I watched. And as they started playing, within about 10 minutes, everyone had left the bar and came and joined to watch because they were that good. You know, and Van de Graaff Generator actually struggled after that to sort of, you know, to perform, if you see what I mean. They were almost played off stage. You know why that is? Because they were Van de Graaff Generator. I've never got on with that band at all. <laughs> <Hawkwind> <laughs> okay, but Van de Graaff struggled and struggled with them. I really have. Well, I, it, the, only, the only reason I went is because I had, um, I mean, I, I, I mean, uh, I had, a, I had an, I was, when I was back, what fifteen? I had an English teacher, and he was a bit of a bit of a hippie, uh, and he was always talking to me about music and this and the other. Because we used to have like um, on a Friday afternoon, we used to have like a session where we could sort of bring albums in and stuff like that, you know. The best um, as they were. 
I had an yeah. RP teacher like that, and she let me bring in Live in the Heart of the City by White Snake. Yeah. Yeah, let's see. I mean, I, I forgot what I, I can't remember what I'd got now, but he was um, he was looking at my, and he said to me, he said, uh, do you know, have you heard of Captain Beefheart? And I said, mm, I've heard of him, but I don't know, you know, because I, I used to get Melody Maker and stuff like that. So I'd heard of it, but I'd never listen. And he goes, well, I'll tell you what, should I get you a ticket? And I goes, oh, yeah, okay. And I think it was 50 pence. So I met, I met my teacher at the town hall. He was there with his girlfriend. And I went to see Captain Beefheart, but I, I, <laughs> you, wouldn't be able, you wouldn't be able to do that today, would you? No, you know? no. No, when I was, a, I've tried to get my students to come with me to watch Captain B fart, and it's never worked. <laughs> I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm not a fan. I, I, I struggled. Probably like you did with Van der Graaf Generator, but I've never I, been. A... I love B fart, but I think the problem with B fart is everyone starts with Trap Mass Replica, and it's a, <laughs> that's a difficult album. And if you get right. some like Ice Cream for Crow, which is a lot more tighter and controlled, that's a really good place to start. And when you listen and focus on it. There's just so much going on, you know. It's he just it's so cool, but it's, he he doesn't like to repeat anything. But uh, it, where I am here, there's a tiny little club in the '60s, which, which is a ballroom dance um, club run by this old guy, the two ballroom dancers, yeah. husband and wife. And in the um, '60s, they started to the kids in my town said, "Can we put bands on?" and um, I think Yes played there, Fleetwood Mac played there, um, and Captain Beefheart played there in 1969, the very first yeah. gig in the UK, which is uh, incredible, you know. Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm not a million miles from you, so I'm sure that, I'm sure, you know, old Mr. Hughes, he probably went to see that, and that's how he got into it. Well, that's the know, thing. So. If you went into, into Frank Freeman's back in 69, 68, and you went to see, like, Fleetwood Mac, Peter Green, you know, then I've seen the photographs. You you had like Robert Plant, you had the you know like Clifford T Ward, all these guys yeah. from from my town are all getting to see these bands, and it actually played a part in them sort of being inspired to go off and do some stuff, you know. Oh. Lauren's here. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I mean... Sheldon, I'm going to move on to you next. Okay. Incredible um, selection of snare drums there. That's very nice. Oh yeah, I don't get to play them as much as I'd like to. Um, so. Yeah, there's a lot of shows that I've been to that are pretty memorable, so I'll just, you know, just keep it to two. One is an up-close experience where I watched Tal Farlow's guitar saved from destruction. So my friend and I went to a Keystone Corner, a famous jazz club in San Francisco, now long closed. Many recordings and great concerts happened there. So we went to the Tal Farlow trio, um, which didn't have a drummer, but was still pretty good. And... Uh, so Tal's doing his thing. He's got some priceless hollow body guitar he's playing. And so they go through the thing, vibes and bass. It's very good. And uh, at the end of the thing, uh, at the end of the set, he takes a break. He sets his guitar down on top of the stool that he's sitting on, just sitting there at the front of the stage and goes off. And my friend is, was a guitar collector. And he was sort of watching that and feeling very nervous about it. And we were right up in the front row. I mean, just like up, just feet away. And the club owner comes out and I think he'd had a drink or two and he starts goes up to the mic and starts like yeah we've got some great shows coming up and his his butt got perilously close to Tal's guitar propped up on the stool and as he kept going on oh, yeah next week he eventually and my friend was getting more and more nervous and he's like well watch it and eventually he bumped the guitar that his he had finally the owner's bumped guitar and it was sliding off the stool headed down to the floor neck first God only knows how many thousands of dollars. And my friend, in the most amazing moment, his hand shot up like this, and he grabbed the neck of the guitar. I mean, it literally was on its way down. It, went, Boom! it was like a Superman move. And he grabbed it and stopped it. said, watch it. And the owner said, turn, what, what? And my friend slowly eased back up onto the stool safe. It was by far, I mean, I've lived a long time, it was by far the most amazing moment of pure skill i've ever seen my um and then the other one was uh to get into the more fusion thing uh the other show i'll browse like an evening with weather report this is at the berkeley community theater in, in the 80s it was in the uh, quartet era with pastorius and peter erskine and so i didn't really i liked the band but i didn't really know what to expect so we went in there and 
the you know the lights were down, the curtains were down. They started playing like uh, the intro to Black Market, and then it came up and it was just Peter Erskine soloing to that intro, and he went he soloed for uh, three or four minutes, just super high energy, just just wailing, and then it kicked into the melody for Black Market, and the rest the other three came out on stage, and they played for about two and a half hours, I'd say. And it was just, I mean, it was just one of those things that even after all these years, just like my jaw still dropped. Just watching all the Pistorius doing his like shuffle slide across the stage and soloing and the whole thing. It's like if you listen to the 830 album, you get a good sense of just like how much power and, and energy that band had. And uh, yeah, that was one even to this day. I just remember how, how loud and glorious it was. I've got a friend, he's a jazz uh, double bass player called Tom Hill. And Steve, did you ever go up to the Ronnie Scotts that was in Birmingham? In... Yeah, yeah. Lovely, you know the house yeah. band in there, and there was that guy that would sing and play double bass. That's Tom, and yeah. he's an absolute legend. When he was at Berkeley, he said he turned up, his teacher wasn't there, and he said they got they got some guy, and he sits down, he has an hour bass lesson with this guy, and he said he was really nice and showed him some stuff. And then he said about four months later, the Jaco Pastorius solo album comes out and he looks at the guy on the cover and he went, oh my God, it's that guy that gave me the lesson at Berkeley, <laughs> you know. And the Tal Farlow story I've got, and Steve might be able to help me out there, in Bearwood, which is in Birmingham, just up the road, there used yeah. to be a pub and there was a venue above venue. the pub upstairs where you could go watch little bands play. Do you remember that venue? In so Wales, was it? <laughs> Um, the only one I can think of is the yeah. Prince of Wales. Yeah, could have, yeah, I think it was that. So I'm in Birmingham one night and my mate goes, do you want to go and see a gig? There's something on at the Prince of Wales, let's say that was a venue. So I go down there and up in that little room upstairs was Tal Farlow. I could not get my head around it. There was about 30 people there. He was on a little tour and it was just him and a vibraphone player, I think, and a double bass player. And I sat down and watched Tal Farlow all night and I couldn't believe he was. I was looking at him thinking, what, what are you doing in Birmingham? It's Bob upstairs, you know, one of the greatest guitarists of the 20th oh, that's century. What's so. the King Ted now? That's the other one. That's the other big one. They have a room upstairs there. Yeah. Hmm. So, um, Ed, Ed, what, what, how, we've got four minutes left. Andrew Stode. You've got I've not got your camera, and I think he's just he's just lurking in the background. But if he wants to come through, what about you, Doran? Do you want to finish off? What, what what's the gig your most memorable gig? And it can't be Pink Floyd. It's Gong. Gong. <laughs> yeah, game, Gong came. Uh, I think it was um, 2013. They came to Israel. They had a session, which was. Explosive. It was David Allen and uh, Gilly Smith and uh, Steve Village. And they had, uh, I think it was another drummer, another keyboard, another bass player. But basically, they did uh, numerous parts from the trilogy, from the legendary trilogy. And Gong is like one of my favorite, favorite bands of all okay. time. And uh, they did like a punk concert. I mean, it was so loud. It was so, it was terrifying in terms of how wild they got. I mean, I thought it would be like at the end of their career and it would be like, you know, a bunch of old guys, but no, I mean, they, they rocked. They rocked like it was crazy. It was the most intense uh, live I've ever seen, I think. The most intense thing I ever saw live was the second time I saw Alan Holdsworth which was in Ronnie Scott's in Birmingham in about 94. That was insane. The One of the most technically incredible gigs I've ever seen that was just in, that was mind-blowing was Frank Zappa, which I saw in 1988. But I think the most memorable one Ooh. for me was I saw Miles Davis uh, in Birmingham. He played as part of the Jazz Festival at the NEC. And just to see that guy walk out on stage and just see him with your own eyes, you know, I can remember my hair just stood on the end, you know, but the and I think once these people are gone, you suddenly realise, my God, I actually saw that person, you know. But when I when I was on when I was touring a lot, I also got to do gigs with Buddy Guy, and I got to do gigs with BB King, and I and I, you know, I, I I did quite a few gigs with BB King to the point where he would see me and say hello, and that really was 
ridiculous. <laughs> BB King would go, always oh, that bloke again. I don't know who he is, but I'm waving him. <laughs> <laughs> we're, that, we're down to the last minute. I enjoyed that very much. So um, thanks for coming in and doing this. And uh, I'm going to try and do this quite regularly now because we, we're slowly growing. There's, 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 how many is that? That's nine, isn't it? We've got nine today. The Friday Club. You know, ho hopefully it's that people start to see that it's not scary and uh, they can just have a normal chat and say whatever they want. They're not, they not, don't have to perform. You say what you want. So, uh, Sheldon, I thought you were going to tell us about the Babish Orchestra. Well, I, I don't have, uh, I can tell it in 20 seconds. Uh, I looked yeah. it up. Um, it was 74 Winterland in San Francisco. A couple of local, relatively unknown bands opened for them. Some A band called Journey and a band called The Tubes. <laughs> I don't really have any memory of Journey's gig set. It was before they got big and famous. Uh, the Tubes were very popular, but the audience was not into them. They were there to see Mahavishnu, so they were booing them. At one point, Journey was like, tossing Mahavishnu. stuff into I the crowd. It. And the crowd is just hurling it back at him, like That's get it, off stage. That's a piece of love, spirituality. Yes. And <laughs> get the fuck the out of here! <laughs> and then it was uh, Ma Vishnu. It was the touring for the vision, visions of the Emerald Beyond stuff. So it was their sort of larger orchestra. It was fifty plus years ago, so I don't have a lot of memories about it. Except it was very loud. I just sitting there going, watching this, going, "What is this? You know what? What is this? You know?" I was just amazed. I didn't understand it. It was really loud, and it was just super dynamic. I want to find a recording of that gig. I haven't found 